Hello and welcome to The Drum. I'm Dan Borsha coming to you from the lands of the Gadigal people. Coming up, the Disability Royal Commission reports the call for a social transformation. AI threat Australian authors on what they call the biggest copyright theft in history. And Grand Final Fever, why Brisbane is now the centre of the sporting world. Joining me on the panel tonight, CBD columnist for the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age, Kishore Napier-Raman. Great to have you on the show. Good to be back, Dan. And fresh from overseas, former New South Wales Liberal Party leader, Kerry Chikorovsky. Thanks for joining us so soon after it's an international okay. flight. The jet lag. I'm over the jet lag. I think I'll be OK. We might need to grab you a cup of coffee during <laughs> the show. Uh, in Canberra, CEO of the First People's Disability Network, Damien Griffiths. Great to have you along. Thanks for having me. And in Brisbane, disability advocate and former Labor staffer, Ellie Dimarchelier. Welcome back. Hi, Dan. And you can join us online using the hashtag The Drum and we live stream on Facebook as well. Well, you might remember earlier this week, Secretary of Home Affairs Michael Pizzullo stepped aside from his position after it was revealed that he used his connections to sway government. Now, a follow-up report by the Nine Papers is alleging that Mr Pizzullo provided British American tobacco access to one of his department's highest-ranking officials on the request of a lobbying company owned by a close friend. He's also alleged to have tried to influence coalition and Labor politicians on the Parliamentary Committee overseeing Australia's national security agencies and laws. And there's also evidence that after being approached by another lobbyist, Mr Bazzolo met with the head of consulting firm PwC to discuss its plan to privatise the COVID quarantine system. And for more on this, we're joined by investigative journalist Nick McKenzie, who broke this story for the Nine Papers. Hey, Nick, good to have you along. Good evening. Before we get into the most recent revelations that you've reported in the last couple of days, walk us through just how we got here. Well, uh, just under a week ago, we revealed a whole case of encrypted phone messages that Mr Pizzullo, Mike Pizzullo, the Secretary of Home Affairs, had sent a Liberal power broker, lobbyist and businessman called Scott Briggs. And what Pizzullo was trying to do was to use Scott Briggs's friendship and influence with two Prime Ministers, Malcolm Turnbull and Scott Morrison, to influence the thinking of those prime ministers about which ministers should be appointed, which ministers should be removed, uh, the advancement of, of key policies, including the uh, the invent of the Department of Home Affairs itself. He was backstabbing public servants, including Martin Parkinson, seeking, uh, seeking Martin Parkinson's job as the Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. All that amounts to a, a very senior public servant and Mike Brazzullo acting in a highly political fashion through a political back channel. And remember this, public servants must be apolitical. That's embedded in the Act. That's part of the uh, Public Service Code of Conduct. He was being anything but. Mm. And, and uh, it's important to note that Mike Pizzolo stepped aside. This investigation is underway. Uh, there's been no allegation of corruption or, or criminality. In your latest piece, uh, you report that Mike Pizzolo gave British American tobacco access to a top official, that Mr Pizzolo separately tried to influence coalition and Labor politicians on that parliamentary committee which is overseeing uh, the infrastructure around national security agencies and laws, and about conversations with PwC about privatising the pandemic quarantine system. Can you step us through what you found? There's a bit to unpack there, but ultimately it's all about access and influence. And again, we expect our public servants, especially the very senior ones, the head of a department, to be really careful about conflicts of interest. So uh, in the case of British American tobacco, big tobacco seeking access to government, in this case, Department of Home Affairs. And why does it want that access? Well, it's trying to push the department to crack down on the illegal tobacco industry. You might think that's a that's out of the good of its of BOT's heart. That's that's That might be part of it. But ultimately, they see illegal tobacco as a revenue drainer on, on themselves. It's, a, it's about a commercial interest. How do they get to home affairs? Well, in this case, there's a lobbyist. That lobbyist owns a company. Uh, this, man, this man's name is Chris Fry, an ex-Labor Party insider. Uh, he's a very good friend of Pizzullo's. He is BOT's registered lobbyist. And it was through his company approaches Michael Pizzullo on behalf of BOT and Pizzullo himself arranges access BAT to one of these very, very senior officials to discuss its concerns. So a classic case there of a, of a conflict of interest that uh, perhaps should have been handled in a different way. Again, with Pricewaterhouse, PwC, it was seeking uh, to advance a plan to privatise pandemic quarantine. It again wanted access to the man at the top of the tree, Michael Buzzullo. A lobbyist steps in as, as a middleman. 
uh, asked Brazil to speak to the CEO of PricewaterhouseCoopers, PwC, Tom Seymour, now ex-CEO, and that access is arranged. Uh, these are things that public servants must be extremely careful about when lobbyists who they know or who are friends with, with them are asking for favours for their clients. Uh, the, the last point is around Mr Buzillo's desire to influence those politicians of, on both sides of the political aisle who sat on the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. Those politicians work for us, the Parliament as well, to ensure that agencies under Michael Buzillo's watch aren't stepping over any, any lines, aren't abusing their power. And Bazzullo is working behind the scenes to get to people like Andrew Hastie, the former chair of that committee, to try to influence his thinking, to either influence the, the way that committee was operating. Again, a back-channel operation, uh, not accountable and arguably very inappropriate for a public servant. And were all these revelations, Nick, from those text messages? Well, a lot of them are, but we've also been doing boots on the ground reporting. So speaking to confidential sources in both the Labor Party and the coalition who know about Pizzullo's approaches to various senior politicians on both sides of the aisle. In some cases, who were uh, a bit mystified by it, uh, who thought, well, what's, what's Mr Pizzullo up to? Is he trying to exact influence? What's his, his long-term game? But ultimately what the messages show, his private encrypted messages to this power broker in the Liberal Party, Scott Briggs, that they show precisely what Buzillo's intent was, which was to seek behind the scenes influence in a highly political fashion. And you know, why is it important? Why is this important? I mean, Mr. Buzillo is in charge of thousands of public servants who are all told, do not be political. You must be independent. You must be accountable. Now, if the very top of the department is not being accountable, using encrypted applications, going through a political back channel, is not being apolitical, going through a highly political channel to seek this backroom influence, what standard does that set the rest of the public service? And this is why it's very unlikely that Mr Buzzillo will ever return to his position. Mm. Um, I, I wonder if we can expect more articles along these lines in the days ahead. Well, I think we're six articles and counting. We, we are going to do more reporting in the Age and the Sydney Morning Herald over the weekend, but we've put out a huge amount of in information. Mm. Uh, I, I, the story's captivated political watchers. It's captivated Canberra. It's captivated our security and intelligence community, all who interact with uh, Mr. Bazzullo or, or who are aware of, of him. Uh, but really, at its core, it's a story that should interest the, the greater public because it's about the way power is used in Canberra. Uh, and, you know, anyone curious about that, I'd encourage them to read our articles because it's a real insight into what goes on behind the scenes. We might suspect it goes on. We very rarely get to see it up close. And that's what Mr. Bazzullo's messages gave us in the public, this unvarnished look at how uh, the very powerful seek to gain even more power to advance their personal and political agenda with their own interests at heart, not the interests perhaps of the public. Mm. Uh, Damien, in the job you have, you often have to lobby government to make sure that, that your voice is heard and that of your, your constituency. So what does this story do? Uh, what message does it send around trust and around the democratic institutions? Well, I think it's deeply disturbing, Dan. Um, we've got a person here that's unelected that seems to wield extraordinary power and influence and also seems to be working beyond their jurisdiction if I read the text messages the right way. Um, we would love to have that kind of access to um, power brokers so that we could get change for First Nations people with disability. It seems to be deeply unfair. Also brings into question the whole Canberra bubble. Um, it's obviously a, a very much a, a reality and who are the actual decision makers in, in, in our system? So it also, to me, uh, only strengthens the case for an Indigenous voice to Parliament. Um, Indigenous people need to have access to this kind of power and influence, need to be able to speak directly to the Australian Parliament and the Cabinet as well, um, because there's too much secret business that seems to go on in Canberra. Yeah, there certainly is seeming. That. Kerry, you've been on both sides of, of this, a senior politician now, a registered mm -hmm. lobbyist. I'm, uh, I'm very keen to hear what your observation is of what we've been seeing and hearing. Well, I think the whole behind the scenes, you know, in you know, hiding, doing it on encrypted messages is something I can't actually understand. It's not something I can relate to. Um, I definitely have clients who've been to Canberra to meet with um, bureaucrats. Those meetings are documented. They're in people's diaries. You know who we're meeting with. There's we keep... a layer of transparency. Yeah, well, we give lists, you know, the, all, everybody in the room, um, we ask everybody in the room, who are you? What's your role? They know who we are, what our roles are. 
There are meeting records kept so that if anybody ever asks, they could say, yes, Kerry met with so-and-so. We talk about what, you know, they record what we talk about. So I can't understand how anyone, particularly as senior as, you know, the secretary would be thinking that that's not the appropriate process. You know, the, the reality is, and, and, you know, people go have a, we have a really bad name. Lobbyists think people are, you know, hiding in dark corridors, speaking to people like this on encrypted messages. Mm. Most of the people I deal with come to me because they have no understanding of how government works, government or bureaucracy. And they come to me because I have an understanding of not only who they need to speak to, you know, within a department, but what that person wants to know. So mm. we actually short, I mean, what we do is we shorten the length of time that people need to be sitting in meetings mm. and we actually provide information to bureaucrats. But nothing that I've heard today, and I mean, Nick, I'm really taken aback by what your articles have been revealing because that is so alien to the way I operate and to the way most people I know operate. Do you think, uh, with, from your experience as a, as a senior politician, yep. Is this just the way things happen, that politicians are constantly being lobbied and having people jostle for what they want to them? Well, again, let me go to the way I operate. Mm. So I never speak to politicians at social functions about anything to do with a client. Never. I will, if, you, know, you know that I, what I'm going to talk to them about is I'm talking to them about rugby. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm talking to them about all those sorts of things. But I, because I'm not going to put a politician into a position where they are somewhat compromised, at all compromised, because I brought up a client in a non um, office environment, right? That's the way I operate. Now, if other people are doing that, and clearly from the stuff that mm. some of the stuff that Nick has revealed, other people do that. And I just, for me, cannot understand how, one, you think that's appropriate, and two, most importantly, how the bureaucrat involved thought that that was fair to be involved in that sort of process. Mm. Kishore, this afternoon, Senator, Independent Senator David Pocock wrote on social media that, quote, lobbying rules are so loose they're practically non-existent. How much uh, of this problem is because of that? I mean, yeah, I think that that is a big part of it. I mean, I think we've got uh, the number of registered lobbyists, so people with, like, an orange pass to come into Parliament is at a record high. And now, like... A lot of that lobbying, it doesn't happen on encrypted messaging channels. It happens in the cold light of day. It happens with lobbyists loitering around Aussie's cafe. It happens with, you know, senior politicians, senior bureaucrats, lobbyists, all going to drinks together at the, hotel, at the realm down the hill from Parliament House. So a lot of this stuff happens because these people are moving in the so same social networks and in the same kind of channels. That's all fine. That's just going to happen. That's the nature of Canberra. Where it comes to cracking down on rules around lobbyists and transparency, yeah, Australia, when it comes to all of this stuff, is really far behind jurisdictions like the United States and the United Kingdom in terms of how much information lobbyists have to put out there about their activities, in terms of how much transparency there is about, like, who ministers are meeting with. So at a federal level, ministerial diaries aren't even, like, disclosed. You have to go through the rigmarole of trying to get them under FOI, which then you get blocked and, you know, you can't get that access. So all this kind of... All these issues around transparency, I think we really lag behind on that. And I think that's... It provides the opportunity for stuff like this to happen and it provides the opportunity for that notion of the Canberra bubble, that murky world where people act with impunity because of that corrosive proximity to power. Yeah, I think there was a story even earlier this year that there wasn't... Uh, a clear register of everyone, or not a public one anyway, of who gets those orange passes, no. so creating a, le a level of ambiguity yeah. around that. I mean, if you're if you are a registered lobbyist and you're dealing with people in Canberra, you have to be on the register. That's right. And you have to have your clients registered. But, but it's not and public. They are, that no, no, no. It's, that, that's right. That's, that's public. public. That's, that's public. a public register. That, that one the one of yeah. who gets the orange pass is, is a separate. Yeah, okay. separate. Oh, yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah. Um, Ellie, I want to bring you in because we know that advocates of all kinds are spending an enormous amount of time trying to get the ear of government, of ministers, uh, to lobby to get their voices and their perspectives heard. Later tonight we're going to be having a conversation about the Disability Royal Commission and about being heard. So I, with all of that circulating, what's your, the, the prism that you're looking at this through and what's your observation of, of this? My observation is there is a, a man at the centre of this story who is looking for more power than he currently has and he's willing to get it in any way he can um, and that it just doesn't pass the pub test. Um, it doesn't pass the test of um, Australians having faith and trust in their public service. Um, this is just not the way that things should operate and it's highly political in a public service that should be apolitical um 
when I meet with politicians, I have a very different conversation than when I meet with bureaucrats. Um, and that's the way it should be. Um, but this uh, gentleman seems to be uh, crossing that line over and over again. And uh, it seems to be to get more power for himself, not to actually advance a policy agenda or um, or actually anything good for uh, the Australian people, but just to collect more power for himself. Mm. It Nick, a lot more broadly, over the last couple of years, a lot of your reporting has centred on where there is behaviour that sees an erosion or, or a complete breakdown of trust. I wonder, from where you're sitting, what impact do you think all the stuff that you're reporting on has on the way that we see, uh, have trust in democratic institutions, in our structures around uh, the society that we live in? Well, unfortunately, when you cast a light on on bad behaviour and the erosion of democracy as this is, then people lose faith in our institutions. That said, the casting of light itself yeah, is, is restorative. You know, we can know the fourth estate, journalism's uh, mostly trying to do its, its best to keep uh, our politicians and public servants and lobbyists in check. And with this reporting, hopefully comes change and improvement. We now have a National Anti-Corruption Commission and I've spent my 21 year career um, championing that sort of accountability by exposing corruption over and over again on both sides of, of the political aisle. Uh, I mean, it's easy to, to bag lobbyists and uh, yeah, we need much more accountability where there's big money uh, and power and lobbyists are at the centre of, of much of, of that. Uh, it's a pretty easy target though. In, in this case, the lobbyists involved, so Scott Briggs of the Liberal Party, we've got Chris Fryer of the Labor Party, there's a bunch of other senior political movers and shakers connected to Pizzullo. They are doing what we expect them to do, what lobbyists do, seeking influence and access, trading favours, etc. You know, we may not like lobbyists, that's what they do. This story for me much more is about public servants. Has our public service been politicised? The Robo Debt Royal Commission told us uh, in that instance that it terribly had been at a great a great public cost and a great cost to vulnerable people. This Pizzullo scandal tells us again, we have a, a public servant at the very head of a department, uh, way too politicised, eroding the public interest. And for me, that's really where there needs to be some, some urgent debate around change. If this is a cultural problem at the tops of some departments, then uh, the government should act and make sure that this sort of behaviour is not happening. Uh, these, these, um, Pizzolo has been called out. His messages have been exposed. But who else is messaging? What are those messages saying? And how do we make sure this sort of behaviour doesn't go on into the future? Okay. And I'd just like to say, though, that one of the things we cannot lose sight of is that we need our public servants, particularly our senior public servants, to be fearless in the advice that they give to the politicians, right? I think the robo-debt inquiry suggested that that hadn't happened mm. and you know, maybe what's happening with this is might, might undermine people's confidence in their ability to do that. But the whole idea of the public service, and particularly the secretaries, the people at the top of the tree, we should expect them to be offering opinions and to be trying to influence policy because, for the greatest of respect, not all wisdom lives in Parliament House. In fact, a lot more can be brought into that joint and I know that from up the, up the road in Macquarie Street. So if you can't rely on the independent, thoughtful advice of senior bureaucrats, that's when I think you have a serious problem with the public service. Yeah, it's certainly troubling. Uh, Nick McKenzie is an investigative journalist with The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. Thanks for joining us, Nick, tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, the biggest act of copyright theft in history. That's what one of Australia's most celebrated authors says about the latest threat from artificial intelligence. Booker Prize winner Richard Flanagan says discovering 10 of his books had been fed to an AI engine felt like his soul had been strip mined. It's been revealed tens of thousands of books have been trawled by Books3, a tool used to train AI for companies such as Meta and Bloomberg, including works by Australian writers Peter Carey, Helen Garner and Thomas Keneally. Authors say they weren't asked for their permission and it amounts to piracy. Esther Anatolitas is a writer and editor of the literary journal Mianjin. She says it's an existential threat. I've been seeing this all over social media today, writers, you know, keying in their name. 
and then discovering to their horror, oh my God, it has consumed, uh, you know, to churn through my novel as well to do who knows what. No writer or artist or craftsperson, no one who makes something makes it for the intention to be churned up and spat out into who knows what. This is your work. If someone wants to use it, they owe you um, uh, consent, a conversation around consent, a conversation around proper payment, um, a sense for the artist or the writer that this is in a framework that is being regulated in some way, that it's not for some who knows what kind of reason. When authors enter into contracts with us, um, they retain their copyright and then they assign certain rights to us. We can publish that piece in these particular formats. What we need right now are um, uh, Australian frameworks, Australian um, uh, regulations for Australian creators and um, audiences. Um, and I know that that work is going to really pick up pace very, very soon. There are writers whose work is experimental, that is playing with form. There are a lot of artists I know who play with ChatGPT, for example, or other you know, visual artists playing with generative AI. All well and good to go and do experimental, innovative stuff with technologies that uh, can astound us in in the future but to do that to do that generative experimental work at the expense of writers copyrighted material the the the, the, the intellectual property of, of of other writers that's just unconscionable and full disclosure i sit on an advisory committee for me and esther and natalitas uh Kishore, does this quite simply boil down to a question around copyright infringement no i think it's a little bit bigger than that i look I don't expect the finest minds of Silicon Valley to really put much uh, value or faith or stock in the importance of literature and art. Let's put that <laughs> to one side. This is about, and again, I, this is a problem throughout the whole AI kind of world because I personally am very, very uneasy about the pursuit of um, artificial intelligence what, in general. Why, why is that? Why are you uneasy? Well, I watched iRobot too many times. Okay. It didn't freak me out about robots. <laughs> to, to put, putting that to the side, though, I think it's just moved at such breakneck speed you know, issues around, like, you know, the Sam Altman, the head of OpenAI, openly talks about his fear of a robot apocalypse and he's a doomsday prepper because of that. So if the people who are making all the money out of it are concerned about it, then I think there is, like, a lot of concerns in that, in that world. There needs to be better regulation. There needs to be a cooling off period and a slowing down. But part of that breakneck speed at which we've, like, pursued artificial intelligence, that's the reason that stuff like this happens. That's the reason that the social costs keep getting tossed out the window. The, the, the ethics never seems to really get a look in, is what I'm trying to say here. And I think this is just a bread and butter example of the ethics not getting a look in and people finding stuff that they've poured their heart and soul into just stripped away because of it. And again, I just don't think a lot of these people really put much value in art and literature and creativity and I think that's also a broader sort of societal wide question but yes a lot more a lot deeper than just copyright yeah. for me. Um, Kerry I want uh, to stick with that thread of ethics but also to mention that I think it's important to note that Australian Society of Authors that said it was horrified to hear this was happening also made the point that it that wasn't objectionable per se to emerging technologies such as AI but it was more an objection to trans lack of transparency and about the remuneration for authors. So is there also a broader question here about the economic security of writers is also at stake? No, yeah, well, I think that's why we're having a screenwriter strike, isn't it, at the exactly. moment? Because they're concerned about the fact that, you know, their creative abilities are now being translated into AI. Everything they've done in the past is now going to be generating its own AI scripts. So I think there is a real issue around it. I think it is around economic security. But, you know, we've had people years and years and years who have people who've um, taken other ideas and then transformed them into their own so there is certainly a literary a cultural a musical trend where you take something and you build on it and you create it what has always happened though when that has been done without the author the composer's um, you know permission you end up in court yes. because people end up suing saying they they, they claim be, you know, breach of copyright or whatever so we've always had a remedy my concern is with all of this you know these organizations are so huge they they're spending a huge amounts of money what little authors are going to have the financial mm. capacity Fight to it. take them on so you're absolutely right what we really need is a framework which says okay you want to use some of my stuff you want to take some of my mm. ideas then you pay me in exactly the same way if I'm using your music in an ad the ad company pays me 
but we need to do that pretty quickly because if we don't do it soon, all these people are going to find themselves having to think about very expensive legal cases and they just won't be able to take on these enormous organisations to, you know, to do it. So the framework needs to be done and it needs to be done. And it needs to be done, and this is the difficulty, it needs to be done internationally. Now, yes, how do you do it internationally? Synchronise it. Yeah, that's well, it. I think that, that point you make there, Gary, about the timing is really important. And, and Ellie, because we know that technology is developing at such a rapid and, and fast pace, so how do we get that balance between developing technology such as AI, then intellectual property, privacy, uh, the rights that go with your uh, creations as well? I think we've already lost the balance. Like I think AI is already so far ahead and we haven't established any kind of framework for regulation or um, protections for our creatives. It's almost like exactly what happened with social media and privacy. Like we just let it go so quickly and then it was almost too late and we'd all given up so much of our data and the information that... Um, putting in regulations around privacy of the social media almost felt like it was too far gone. And that's what it's feeling like with AI is that it's almost too far ahead of us to regulate now. If we don't get onto it right now, um, it's too far gone. Um, and mm. the regulators are so far behind. That is the main problem. Um, there is no balance between that constant developing and that looking after the protections of creatives um, from all different backgrounds. Yeah, there's a bit of that thing about uh, not waiting until the horse is bolted to shut the gate. Uh, Damien, I know that you love books. How does it sit with you, the notion of AI being the author that you're sitting there reading? Yeah, I also find this really disturbing and I think the clues in the title, artificial intelligence, so it's not, not real intelligence, um, it's taken from other sources, it mm. seems to be stolen to me. So if someone like, like Richard Flanagan has issues in it uh, for it, uh, then that's good enough for me. Um, I think there's, uh, Ellie's right, things have moved way too quickly. Uh, we don't have a regular, regulatory framework to deal with this, this rapid change. And also it's starting to me to feel a bit like the machines taking over, like it's already been said. Um, surely to be human, part of being human is to be creative, is to make music, write books, uh, produce art. If these things are going to be taken over by machines, then, gee, that sounds very, very scary to me. And, and just to be devil's advocate, does anyone think that there, there could be something good to come from all of this? Well, I mean, there is stuff coming out, yep. which is good. I mean, if you look at what they're doing in terms of medicine and science and all those sorts of things, it is absolutely the case that AI is helping in, um, to advance a lot of the you know, experiments that we're doing, the things that we're you know, looking for, cures for cancer. AI is playing quite a significant role in, in all of that stuff. And I don't think anybody would object to AI being part of those solutions. I think where we're all concerned, and I absolutely think it's right, is you know, we are human. We believe that we are the source of creativity. We are the source of emotion. We are the source of, you know, intelligent function, which is innately ours as humans. What we're all worried about is that we're going to lose all of that and some machine, to your point, the robots, are going to come and take it away. And I think that is what would people more generally would be concerned about, all that human stuff yeah. that we are so very, very conscious of and very protective of. Yeah, because sure, just to round us out on this segment, we've just had a conversation about the power of journalism mm. to shine a spotlight. Is there a risk to journalism and reporting? Because we have seen articles where you can read to and, and are asked, who wrote this, a person or AI? And sometimes you can't tell. Well, I mean, yeah, it's a real, real concern because journalism was already operating in a world in which we're trying to do more with less, in which mm. budgets have been progressively slashed and newsrooms have been whittled down over decades. And... Mm. A lot of media companies have been spent years looking at where they can cut costs and, uh, you know, seeing journalism as a kind of expensive sort of thing. Um, and if, if AI can come in and do it quicker, there's going to be a big shift towards that. And it's going to be, frankly, it's going to be the younger journalists trying to break into the newsroom, working on things like breaking news, you miss out. And that's a whole generation then that, it, yeah, it, it's a real risk, yeah. I fear. 
I reckon we're going to be talking about mm. AI for, for quite a while. We're going to shift gears now and after four and a half years of work, the Disability Royal Commission, Australia's largest ever investigation into the lives of people with disability, has made public its 222 recommendations. The 356-page final report recommends the federal government legislate a Disability Rights Act, create a new ministerial role and establish a National Disability Commission. And it says so-called segregation settings such as schools, group homes and places of work that only employ people with disabilities should be phased out over the coming 10 to 30 years. The ABC has been closely following the inquiries, many shocking and traumatic stories from day one. And we'll speak with our National Disability Affairs reporter Naz Campanella in a moment. But if you need a, ref a refresher, the drums David Taylor takes a look back. We are not victims of our own bodies. We are survivors of how you treat us. It's a strong statement made earlier this month on the final day of hearings. Formerly known as the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability, the Commission was set up in 2019. It was tasked with investigating experiences and conditions in schools, workplaces, the justice system, disability and mental health facilities, group homes and boarding houses, family homes and hospitals. The inquiry held 32 public hearings and travelled to every state and territory in the country collecting evidence. Overall, more than 10,000 people shared their stories via public hearings, submissions or private sessions, including actress Chloe Hayden, who shared her sense of isolation. My mum cried when I got my autism diagnosis because her first thought was my child is going to turn into Rain Man. I grew up my whole life thinking that I wasn't supposed to exist and a very, very large reason for that was because I didn't see myself represented. The Commission also heard of what some disability advocates have described as the incredible level of violence going on in the disability community. Your ex, who will use that to describe him, in describing the sexual assaults he told the police, she couldn't feel it anyway. I remember hearing that for the first time when he, he gave his statement to police and being um, shocked about it because after assaults he would always apologise and say how sorry he was and that he was such a bad person and he would try not to do it again. Diane Lyons has muscular dystrophy and spoke of her experiences while in prison. I couldn't use the toilet because it was locked. Um, the toilet was toilet and shower were between the white room and the padded cell so it was locked on both sides and I had to wait. Uh, a nurse could not come into the room without two officers being present. I had to wait sometimes two hours uh, when I really needed to go to the toilet. And finally today, hours after the Commission's report was made public, the government committed to establishing a task force. The task force will coordinate the Australian government's response, particularly focused on the recommendations that are directed towards the Commonwealth. But stopped short of formally responding to any of the 222 recommendations. But as I've outlined, we have a process that will start today where our government will carefully consider the final report and give it the attention it deserves. Ellie, I want to start with you. To me, this felt like a really massive, monumental day. How did it feel to you? Um, I found it surprisingly emotional. Um, uh, in the hours leading up to when the report uh, was released, I was actually surprisingly worried. Uh, I was worried that the... 10,000 people with disability who had poured out their stories of the worst days of their lives to this commission of abuse and neglect and exploitation of some of the worst stories you'll ever hear, um, that that wouldn't be enough to create the kind of recommendations we need to change the 
the landscape for people with disability. I was fearful that the recommendations wouldn't wouldn't go far enough. And as I poured through the recommendations, the 222 and read through them and started to realize that this is actually creating a vision for a more inclusive Australian society, it started to become a bit overwhelming. This is a huge monumental report that that has the potential, if implemented correctly, to change the lives of the 4.4 million Australians that live with disabilities in just every way, shape and form, to end segregation where we are excluded and we are not, we are seen as others that are put over there, that are put over there because we are burdens, because we are troublemakers, because we are just too hard to handle, so we are othered. To end that kind of segregation and say, no, you are equal and you are worthy as a human being to come and be with us. To read that in a in a national document of this significance is it's it uh, makes me proud of our community for what it has achieved, but it makes me uh, determined to see it come to life. But that actually requires all Australians to buy into this and. Um, and that's what I'm passionate about now is making sure all Australians understand what what needs to be done next, what needs to be done next to change the lives of people with disability because we cannot stay where we are. Um, we cannot do that for all the people that came forward. That was, that was so powerful, Ellie. Thank you. And, and when you speak of being other, that is so difficult to hear and it's what we kept seeing throughout the testimony I think to this Royal Commission that was completely demoralising. Damien, you were actually involved uh, with the Royal Commission, you were on the First Nations, uh, First Nations People's Strategic Advisory Group. How have you received this report today? Oh, like Ellie, uh, very emotional day, um, a very traumatic day and I want to acknowledge that Today has probably been re-traumatising re for many Australians with disability, including First Nations people with disability. And I do want to take a moment to acknowledge those First Nations people with disability and Australians with disability who have died because of abuse and neglect. And also acknowledge some of the advocates that have gone before that aren't here today to see the report being tabled and I do want to make special mention of two of my elders and two of my organisational elders, Uncle Lester Bostock and Aunty Gail Rankin, who were powerful and wise leaders of the social movement of First Nations people with disability who aren't with us today. But I think one of the things that's really positive, if you like, is there's a very significant chapter written about uh, issues for First Nations people with disability, a, a number of very clear recommendations one of them that we uh, are anxious to get started on and look should have been started on 20 years ago, but is in the establishment of a First Nations Disability Forum. The Royal Commission has recommended that that be established by March 2024, but we're ready to start tomorrow. Um, many First Nations people with disability, many communities already have solutions for providing support to their community members with disability. We need to get on with the work. The other thing I just want to take the opportunity to say is First Nations people with disability in our communities have a gift to give to the country. In traditional language, there is no comparable word to disability. Labels of disability are a Western construct. Um, the idea of segregation, people living separately is totally foreign to First Nations communities. So we are the thought leaders on inclusion and we have a gift to give the Australian community about how you create a society that values and supports every one of its community members. Um, we've had a long history of First Nations people that are blind, for instance, that are traditional healers. We've had a long history of sign languages that are still in existence today. And we've had uh, many of our songmen, for example, were people with 
with vision impairment, uh, a number of different disability types. So we have a lot to offer the Australian community in terms of inclusion, and we're really encouraged by the chapter that's been written. But like Ellie, it's now about cracking on and doing the work. Yeah. Uh, and I want to bring on in uh, my colleague, the ABC's Disability Affairs reporter, Naz Campanella. Naz, thanks for joining me. We talked, we actually had a conversation earlier about what we wanted to cover off. And after hearing just now from Damien and Ellie, I want to go off script a little bit because <laughs> you and I need to be impartial when we're doing our jobs. Often it's about our communities and, and about people that we are, that we know that are part of our families, the, the people around us. Mm. Can I just ask, how, how are you feeling after, after this, after covering it for so long and then leading the, our coverage today? Oh, it has been a very long four and a half years. Uh, I have spent years sitting in a room with my team, uh, listening to day in, day out to horrible stories. A lot of them I weren't surprised by because as a member of this beautiful disabled community of 4.4 million people, I know about a lot of this violence, mm. abuse, neglect and exploitation. And I would be lying if I said that I didn't get emotional in almost every hearing that I sat through. But I think what struck me was the scale at which people that we know and love have been failed by, uh, you know, levels of, of government, by systems, by providers, by people that are supposed to protect us uh, or, or, you know, them, and by people who are supposed to be trusted. And so that really struck me. And today I, I don't think that I could have put it any more beautifully than Ellie and Damien have done by saying that this really has been a, a, a day of mixed emotions. I mean, one of the advocates today said it's, it's a mixed day of pride and grief. And I, I think that really sums it up. Um, because people have put themselves out there like never before to share stories, their darkest and most deepest things that have happened to them. And they need to know now that this hasn't all been for nothing. Yeah, that it matters and that they've been heard and listened to. Mm. Before we get into the, the recommendations, Naz, the remit of this Royal Commission was, was incredibly broad. It covered health, education, justice, employment, just to name a few, that there were so many more. I wonder if you've reflected on just how big that scope is or was. Yeah, the, the scope was big and the disability community wanted it to be big because they knew that the violence and abuse, neglect and exploitation was happening in such a broad range of settings, from education, from uh, closed employment settings, from those group homes, from settings where no one's allowed in, where no one's looking, um, but then also more broadly on the streets. You know, we heard strange, uh, people talk in their evidence uh, very powerfully about people of short stature, for example, being mocked by strangers in the street, people being sexually assaulted on trains, people being laughed at. Um, and I think that really shows us that this scope of this Royal Commission needed to be so broad because it affects people with disability in every aspect of their life. Mm. We mentioned at the, the start 222 recommendations. It's what, a lot. <laughs> it, it, it is a lot, but it's a, it's a huge task that the Commission had. What one stood out to you? What recommendations? Yeah, look, it, it is huge. It's 12 volumes, uh, you know, 5,000 pages, 222 recommendations, and I think we're still very much sifting through all of that. I think it will take days for the yeah. community to go through yeah. it. But some of the ones that have stuck out really have been uh, the recommendation around uh, strengthening the Disability Discrimination Act, the introduction of uh, a, a Disability Rights Act to enshrine, uh, you know, internationally enshrine the rights of the human rights of people with disability. Um, there was also a recommendation around a disability portfolio in government and for a, a dedicated minister within that for disability inclusion, um, a national disability uh, c commission and also a complaints mechanism and also one that really stuck out for me and, and the evidence around this one really will never leave me, I don't think, but the idea of forced sterilisation for women with disability and the legislation around that and the recommendations are that you should not be forcibly sterilised based on disability. And we heard stories of this. One of them I will share with you because it will never leave me. Uh, a person went in to hospital being told that they were having their appendix removed mm -hmm. and they were only found out when they were thinking about having children that they were sterilised years later. And that should never have happened. That is just horrifying. <laughs> how, how do you think... Australia will grapple with, with this, the, the complexity and the horror of this. 
Look, I think the disability community would argue some of these things are quite easy to implement, like a portfolio, like a minister, uh, you know, like a complaints mechanism. Some of those things are easy. It's, it's the harder things around attitudinal change. You know, I think the community would argue that there needs to be a drastic shift in the way that disability is perceived, considered in society, and that does not happen overnight. Mm. Ellie, you touched on this uh, at the start about some of the absolutely horrifying testimony that you were talking about what didn't come as a surprise to you or members of your community. What do you think it's taught the rest of us in Australia about what it means to live with disability in Australia right now? To be honest, I don't know if the public has been uh, involved enough in the Royal Commission to actually grasp what it means. And this is our fight now, is it has been our Royal Commission, uh, the Disability Community's Royal Commission, but today it is Australia's report. And it, Australia needs to grapple with the crimes that were committed against um, people with disability under their name um, in their communities next door to them. Uh, they need to look at the barriers they put up in their lives to keep people with disability out. And as Naz mentioned, um, the Royal Commission puts many recommendations forward around removing structural changes, but it's all well and good to open up all workplaces to people with disability. But if they go in there and people still aren't willing to accommodate a person's disability needs, then it's, it's no good. We need to change attitudes. We need to change how people view disability. We need to stop the sni sniggering and the laughing and the thinking that people with disability are not equal and not worthy as they are, as they present. They don't need to change to fit into society. They don't need to change to be included. We are equal and worthy as we are, and we need society to welcome us in. And that is the piece that the Australian people need to give us. And um, that's the challenge I give to the Australian people. Um, but I'm not sure if uh, they're willing to grasp it with both hands. Hmm. Uh, Damien, the same question to you. What do you think that the message is to Australians and what do you think it exposed about our country? Yeah, I mean, I've been reflecting today on some of the language of disability advocates that went well before uh, today. And for, for a lot of Australians with disability, for First Nations people with disability, living with disability is a form of social apartheid. If you take the definition of apartheid to mean, which it means to live apart, then that's self-evident that we have many Australians who aren't having the opportunity to participate in their own communities and the wider community. Um, it's also, as, as Naz and Ellie have so powerfully said, uh, it requires a shift in thinking on the part of the wider Australian community and it goes to who we want to be as a nation. There's that well-worn phrase that says, you know, you, you measure a society by how effectively or how inclusive it is of its most vulnerable people. Then if we take that definition and particularly from a First Nations people with disability perspective, who we would say are some of the most disadvantaged Australians because they experience discrimination based on race and ableism, then we're failing. We're failing as a society. Some of the human rights abuses that go on in Australia against people with disability are extraordinary. We've heard forced sterilisation. There's also a number of First Nations people with disability who are indefinitely detained in Australian prisons. We need to stop and think about this for a moment and just absorb that and think that do we really want to be a nation that is actively uh, continuing to marginalise a significant part of its population? Hmm. Now, as one of the, the focus areas was around segregation of schools, employment, 
and group homes, and, and it seemed as though the commissioners were were split on what we, which way to go and what was the best way to tackle that. But what was clear from the testimony, surely, was that the status quo is not working. Mm, that's definite. That that's definitely uh, the way that the commissioners um, approach this. That the status quo is not okay and is not working. Let me step you through it. It, it is a little complicated. So let's start with group homes. Um, the 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 recommendation is that group homes are, are phased out in the next 15 years. And now when we talk about group homes, we're talking about about 17,000 people with disability across Australia who live in these settings. And I need to point out that a large proportion of those people are people with intellectual disability. And I think that's really important to state here because people with intellectual disability often don't get a voice at the table uh, with these discussions. And so I really want to put that on the record, that they are uh, the people impacted with something like this. So um, that to be phased out in 15 years, and the next one was uh, segregated employment. So for that to be phased out uh, by 2034, and you know these are about 20,000 people, again, majority people with intellectual disability across Australia, working in these sort of Australian disability enterprises or ADEs or you know sheltered workshops is the kind of older term for them, uh, where they were doing things like packing and cleaning for just over two dollars an hour. It is legal, um, but there's a recommendation to phase this out by 2034 and to raise the wages, um, you know, for, for these people. The third one was around education and for special schools, and this is one approach at least by, by three of the commissioners, uh, for special schools and segregated education to be phased out uh, using, you know, particular milestones, but by the end of 2051 for that to be no longer the case where students are enrolled in, in special education. The other three commissioners in regards to education had, I guess, a softer approach where they wanted stronger relationships between special schools and mainstream education. And they didn't want sort of milestones and targets or, you know, a, a set date on that. I think what's important to note with this split is that the division uh, you know, with the commissioners on these three areas, and it's not three to three on, on all three, it's sort of different breakdowns, mm. um, I think reflects in society that there has always been a division about the value that people with disability have, the, the, how valuable our lives are and the contributions that we can make. And um, I think the division just reflects that, um, you know, I, I think it really does point to the, the shift that we need in society um, to, to stop segregation and, and how do you do that? The other thing is as well, I think there's going to be a lot of families who are worried to hear things like, you know, in 15 years, my child's group home will be no longer or my child is having a great time, you know, they're really enjoying and thriving at special school and it will be no longer. I think we need to point out that these are recommendations that the report makes very clear that change won't happen overnight and more importantly that it must be done in consultation at every step of the way with people with disability. Yeah that that concept. Can, Ellie please. Can, can we be really clear that while uh, Naz might be right that the community is divided people with disability are not divided. Absolutely What not. we heard through the um, public hearings is that where we are segregated, that is where violence and abuse festers and because there is not any accountability and transparency. Mm. And we heard loud and clear from people with disability, including the two commissioners with disability, that we need to end segregation. We need to end separate but equal. That is not how we live in this society. And um, the, our community has been very clear that segregation is not okay in any situation. So um, uh, while, you know, parents and loved ones and uh, teachers all have a right to have an opinion, I think it's people with disability that deserve to really make the final decision on how we live our lives. Mm. Ellie's right, that is, and, and I want to make very clear that I pointed out in the very beginning here, this is where people with disability have told mm. everyone in these particular close settings of, of, you know, where segregated housing, employment and education, where the violence and abuse has been 
allowed to thrive because there is there is a, a lack of people watching. There is a lack of accountability. Also, that it's more likely, and we've heard this time and time again, that if you are in segregated education, you are more likely to be in segregated employment and therefore segregated housing. And other aspects of your life will always be segregated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kerry, uh, one of the recommendations that Naz touched on there was around the government governance arrangements for disability. Uh, the calls and the recommendations for disability specific portfolio department and minister ought to be established by the end of 2024. I wonder if you have a, a view on, on the recommendations and the time frame. Uh, well, I think the people who would be most interested in those recommendations would be Minister Shorten and Minister Rishworth, who yeah. already have responsibility, they would say, for a lot of the areas of, um, that have been discussed already tonight, uh, this is why the government has set up a task force. They haven't said that they're going to adopt all the recommendations. They will go and have a look at that. And look, to be perfectly blunt, a Labor government with uh, the reputation that this government has, it would not be out of the question that they would decide to do exactly that. A commission might take a little bit more time, um, but setting up a portfolio responsibility for it, shouldn't that should be quite easily done if the government decides that it's an appropriate way mm in order to incorporate that into the cabinet process because you want that minister to be in cabinet. There is no doubt in my mind that that minister, if you're going to create that ministry, has to be within cabinet. So it, that's probably one of the easier recommendations for the, uh, for the government to adopt, but they will take some time to look at all of them and they will then prioritise the ones which they think are the most relevant to them and their ability to deliver. Just quickly, I mean, for example, in relation to the education, that will be a conversation with the states because schools are actually looked after by the states. So there's a whole lot of other stuff that will have to be discussed around all those recommendations. Mm. Um, Kishore, I wonder if you've got a view about the, the media reporting uh, of this. We are crunching time uh, towards the end of the show. Yeah, look, I, I mean, I think a lot of the issues that this report raises are issues of, uh, like we talked about, of people with disabilities being segregated from the public con conversation, being swept aside and forgotten. And I don't think there's been enough attention on what Ellie rightly calls should be Australia's report. Mm. I think it's operating in a context of, you know, shrunken newsrooms and all that kind of thing. But I think we need to, now that it's out there, we need to really need to grapple on it, uh, grapple with it, and we need to keep the focus on it um, because it has passed a lot of people by, unfortunately. Mm. Naz, we've got about a, a minute left. You touched on before about people that might be hearing and reading this today and feeling really concerned. What do you say to them? Uh, I think uh, what what I want to say is um, I think we just need to keep, or the community needs to keep mm. uh, telling people the simple phrase, it's nothing about us without us. It's as simple as that. Yeah, well, it is uh, very powerful. Thank you uh, so much. If this topic has raised any issues for you, please call Lifeline on 13 11 14, or you can also call Beyond Blue on 1300 22 46 36. And that is all we have time for. Thank you so much to our panel, Kishore Napier-Ram and Kerry Chikorovsky, Damien Griffiths and Ellie Dimarchelier, and of course our special guest, uh, Naz Campanella, the ABC's Disability Affairs reporter. Do have an excellent weekend. I'll be back with you next week. For now, though, good night. <laughs>